Hi, Rob McIver here. Let's talk about the nominative and accusative cases in the Greek New Testament. Along the way, we'll be looking at what is a noun, how the nominative and accusative are used to show the subject and direct object of verbs, and probably importantly towards the end, we'll be looking at tips to make all of this easier. You may want to check that out because there is an interesting class exercise that I do and you will be astonished at how easy it makes learning the noun. All right then, let's begin by asking what is a noun? Well, the simplest explanation is to say a noun is the name of something. And grammarians, being what they are, have looked at nouns and said there are at least four types of nouns in English. There are proper nouns. These are the names of objects like books and cars and carpet and grass and tree. There are abstract nouns like love, joy, peace. There are collective nouns like flock. There are proper nouns. <laughs> yes, strange that they're called proper nouns, isn't it? But these are the names of people and places. So my name is Robert. Robert is a proper noun. It has a capital in English and, interestingly enough, also in Greek. And the names of the cities like Jerusalem and Cairo and London and New York and Sydney, they are all proper names as well. Now, the noun is introduced in chapters 4 and 5 of my book, Beginning New Testament Greek Made Easier. And if I look at the vocabulary list in chapter 1 and chapter 4 and chapter 5, I find 22 nouns. Twelve of them are common nouns. These are God, well, God with a capital G and a small g, Christ, brother, man, bread, slave, word, son, angel, world, law, house. There are two collective nouns people and crowd. There are eight proper nouns. Abraham, David, Israel, Jerusalem, Jesus, John, Mary, Peter. And, well, there are no abstract nouns. You have to wait to the vocabulary in chapter 8 to find the abstract nouns joy, love, sin, and wisdom. So those are all nouns. In Greek, nouns come in three declensions, three genders, and five cases. All right, well, what is a declension? A declension is a group of nouns that follow the same pattern when they make their different case endings. So there's nothing mysterious about it. And in fact, the division into three declensions goes right back to classical times. And so the Greek grammarians that were describing their own language said, well, if, if we look at the nouns, there's one group that follows this pattern, more or less. They are the first declension. There's one group that follows that pattern. That's the second declension. And there's a whole lot of interesting nouns that follow the third declension. We will just take one of them at a time and meet them in gradual steps. That's one of the things that we can do to make our study of the language easier just to take a little bit and learn that, and then a little bit extra and learn that, and then slowly build up our understanding of the language. We're going to begin with the second declension nouns, the three genders. There are masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. So I've written down some masculine nouns. There's adelphos, which means brother, artos, which means bread, there are feminine nouns like Adelphe, sister, and phone, voice. And there are neuter nouns like Biblion, book, and Ergon, work. Now, if you've only ever spoken English, it will surprise you to discover that everything has a gender. Now, some of these make sense. Adelphos for brother makes sense, doesn't it? That's a male person, so a male noun would work with that, a masculine noun. A Adelphe, a sister, a, a, a sister is feminine, a woman, and therefore 
feminine makes sense. But why is phone feminine and artos masculine and biblion neuter? Well, they just are. <laughs> yes. Well, if you've learned French or Spanish or Italian, this will be no surprise to you that in other languages, most everything has a gender, and some of the genders can seem rather arbitrary. The good thing, though, is Greek gives you clues as to what gender the noun is. Those clues will emerge as you meet the different types of noun. Now, what are the five cases? Well, there's the nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive, and dative. It might be easier to explain what a case is if I show you an actual noun. Here is the noun logos. It is masculine and it's second declension. Second declension just means this noun is one of a group of nouns with similar looking endings. Now we have here the noun listed in nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive and dative, singular, and then the same plural. And if you go down the list, you will see logos, loge, logon, logu, logo. You will see that there is part of the noun that stays the same, log, but the endings are different depending on the case. So here is one way to think of case. Case is the different endings that can be placed on a Greek noun. I should probably let you know that this listing of all the different cases of a noun is called a declension. And we can describe Greek as a declining language because it uses the endings of words to show their grammatical meaning. <laughs> I, I used to have a heading in my book called Greek is a declining language. <laughs> And I thought, no, you can misunderstand that. Greek is not a declining language in that sense. So I said it is Greek as an inflected language. This just means that Greek uses the endings on words to show the grammatical function of that word. So what has this got to do with case? If you look at the noun in Greek, it has different endings depending on what its grammatical function is. And we're only going to look at two of them in this video. And the two are the nominative and the accusative. And the nominative is used almost exclusively as the subject of a verb. And the accusative is used very often to be the direct object of a verb. And we're going to talk about the genitive and dative in separate videos. It makes sense, though, to have the nominative and accusative treated together in one video because one is the subject of the verb and the other is the direct object of the verb. And together, the subject, verb and direct object can make a simple sentence. So the case is the ending on a noun that shows its grammatical function. Now we need to talk about subjects and direct objects in English. Many of you will know already what a subject is and what a direct object is, but remember this is nominatives and accusatives made easier. So let's start making sure that everybody's on the same page. What is the subject of a verb in English? And what is the direct object of a verb in English? And how do we tell the difference? <laughs> I'm smiling because I have a clear memory of a class where I was learning German. And the teacher was trying to explain to us what a subject was in English and what a direct object was in English. And I said, excuse me, ma'am, you can tell what a subject is because in English, the sentence usually goes subject, verb, direct object. And the teacher, being a German, thought carefully about this and said, mm, no, that doesn't work all the time. <laughs> yes, well, it may not work all the time. But I think if you're a native English speaker, the natural pattern is subject, verb, direct object. And if you change the order around, it's for asking questions or 
it's for making poetry or it's making some particular different statement. And your brain thinks, well, that's a different order, therefore something important is going on. But here and now, let's just take this as the typical way an English sentence is put together. Subject, verb, direct object. And let's look at a very short English sentence. The boy hits the ball. The verb is hits. The boy is the subject of the verb. And the ball is the direct object of the verb. And in English, word order is very important. And I amuse myself by thinking of these two sentences. The man bites the dog and the dog bites the man. Can you see the difference? The subject is the noun that comes before the verb and the direct object comes after the verb. So English indicates the subject and direct object by its position in a sentence. Greek, on the other hand, indicates the subject and direct object of a verb by the case that is used. Yes, position can be important in the way Greek is expressed, but it is much less important than it is in English. When we're translating from Greek into English, because English wants the subject first, one of the things we've got to do is quickly identify the subject. And how do we identify the subject? Well, Greek shows what the subject is by putting it in the nominative case. The direct object is put in the accusative case. And here are the endings for the nominative and accusative. So in its nominative case, the noun logos is logos, all right? We learn a noun in its nominative singular case. The accusative is log on, the nominative plural is log oi, and the accusative plural is log us. And here are some general guidelines. If it is the subject of the verb, it will be in the nominative case. If it's the direct object of the verb, it will be in the accusative case. Now, most nominatives that you find in the New Testament are, in fact, the subject of a verb. Many of the accusatives are the direct object of a verb. Now, even though we don't have a lot of grammar, we've met verbs, we've met nouns, we can make simple sentences, we can already formulate good rules for translating. And these rules are actually very powerful. They are steps that you will follow no matter how complex the sentence becomes. In fact, they become much more important with complex sentences. Anyway, what are they? Well, the first thing you look for in translating a sentence is look for the main verb. Then look for the subject of the verb because... In English, we want the subject very early in the process because we demand a subject before the verb. And then we look for the direct object, which will be in the accusative case. Here are some actual examples of Greek sentences showing how nominatives are subjects and accusatives are direct objects. So we have legi, logon, anthropos. Now, it is correct to say anthropos legi logon, but the Greeks would not usually put it in that order. So it goes legi, which is, he says, logon, a word, anthropos, a man, or a human. So we have to decide which is the main verb. Well, there is one verb there, it's legi. So what is the subject of the sentence? Is it logon or anthropos? Well, we remember that os is the nominative case ending. And so anthropos, a man or a human, must be the subject of the verb. So the sentence goes, a human says a word. Legi, logus, anthropos. We have here the verb legi. Logus is plural, accusative plural, still the direct object, and anthropos is singular. A man or a human says words. It's plural. 
Then we have anthropoi. Anthropoi being men say a word and then men say words. You can see that there are all kinds of possibilities of singular and plural. One thing you will want to notice though is that the verb becomes plural only when the subject is plural. So it's legusi logon anthropoi, legusi logus anthropoi, and the legusi is a plural verb because the subject is plural. The subject is anthropoi. How do we know it was the subject? Because it is in the nominative case. Because the position of the noun is not as important in Greek. So the nominative case shows that this is the subject of the verb and Greek sometimes puts it further back in the sentence. Now something else I'd like to introduce you to is the Greek equivalent of the English word the. English has two articles, an indefinite article a or an and a definite article the. Greek only has a definite article. It is the article ho, ton, hoi, tus. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. The article declines as well. So it has different forms for the different cases. The English definite article is a good way to understand the Greek definite article, at least for a start. In fact, the use of articles is one of the most idiomatic things about a particular language. But let's begin simply, and this is New Testament Greek made easier. Later on, we'll talk about some of the more complex things that can happen with a Greek article. So, knowing that there is a Greek article gives us many more options. We have legai, logon, anthropos. A man says a word. We have legai, logon, ho, anthropos. The man says a word. So a man is anybody. The man is a specific person. So the definite article makes the noun definite, belongs to a specific instance. Legon, ton, logon, anthropos. A man says the word. Legai ton logon ho anthropos. The man says the word. Legai tus logus anthropos. A man says the words. Legusi logon hoi anthropoi. The men say a word. And legusi tus logus hoi anthropoi. The men say the words. You'll notice the definite article has the same number and case as the noun that it's associated with. And when we learn nouns that are feminine as well, you will find that they match not only their number and case, they also match their gender. So there's other definite articles to learn when we get to feminine and neuter nouns. Now, here are some of the second declension nouns that occur most frequently in the New Testament. For example, Adelphos is found 343 times in the New Testament. It means brother. Anthropos, 548 times. And one of our strategies for making Greek easier is we will concentrate on learning the more frequently occurring nouns first. As usual, why don't I just say the word and give you a chance to repeat it back to me? Adelphos. Anthropos. Artos, doulos, laos, logos, quios. Now, as well as these seven nouns, I have listed other words that are found very frequently in the New Testament. One of them is the word chi, which usually means and, although it can sometimes be translated as also or even. The word Ha huh, is the nominative masculine singular of the definite article, and that is found 2,933 times in the New Testament. The accusative masculine singular, ton, is found 
1581 times. The nominative masculine plural definite article, hoi, is found 1117 times. And the accusative masculine plural, tus, is found 731 times. So these are words that are found really often. You can hardly read a sentence without meeting one of these words. So it's worthwhile knowing them well and thoroughly. Now here is something where Greek provides a help because it lets us know what are verbs and what are nouns. Because when we learn them in a vocabulary, a verb is always going to finish with omega, omai, or me. A masculine second declension noun is always going to end with os. So if we meet the word pistuo in a vocabulary, we will know that it is a verb because it finishes with an omega. If we meet the word adelphos in a vocabulary, it finishes with an os, therefore it must be a noun. Not only that, we know it is masculine and we know that it is second declension. Well, <laughs> well, let me just say almost always <laughs> in front of that sentence, okay? But at the moment, everything that you've learnt in the vocabulary that finishes with os is a masculine second declension nouns. And there will be exceptions later, but they are rare exceptions. If, if your grammar happens to be weaker than you would like, one of the hidden benefits of learning another language is you will learn what a verb is, what its subject is, and what its direct object is. So you will learn English grammar alongside of learning Greek grammar. Here is the important section, isn't it? How do we make all of this easier? Well, I have some tips here. The first one is learn your vocabulary. Learn it really well. The second one is learn paradigms and declensions. And seeing this video is on a noun, learn the declension. And even though we haven't met the vocative and the genitive and the dative cases yet, it's probably worth learning the full declension of logos at this stage. Now, I have a treat with you. I have a video of me introducing a class to the full declension of logos and by the time we've finished, they know it. And, mini miracle, it takes less than five minutes. It's astonishing how easy it is to learn. So, join me with my class. All right, so we're going to be learning Logos today. And I wanted to share with you on video land uh, what it's like to just do it in class. So, here we go. Can everybody stand up where they are? That's including those that are on Zoom. So I'm going to say it, and then you are going to repeat it to me, and we will then start saying it together, and then we will get marching and get faster, and then we're going to do it for memory. It's going to be miraculous. It's going to be wonderful. Okay, you are ready? All right, log off. Log off. Log, off. log in. Log on. Log on. Logu. Logu. Logo. Logo. Logoi. 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 Logus. Logus. Logon. Logon. Logois. Logois. Now a couple of things. I'm emphasizing the last syllable more than I should because the accent's on the first syllable, but I'm trying to get the sound in my memory. And there is two groups of five, so we will have a beat between the two, just so that we can go. So say it with me now. Logos, logge, logon, logu, logo. Beat. Logoi, logoi, logus. Starting with logoi. Logoi, logoi, logus, logo, logois. Let's see if we can do a slow walk and speed it up a bit. Logos, logge, logon, logu, logo. Logoi, logoi, logus, logon, logois. Logos, logge, logon, logu, logo. Logoi, logoi, logus, logon, logois. Logos, logge, logon, logu, logo. Logoi, logoi, logus, logon, logus. Logos, logge, logon, logu, logo. 
Lagoy, Lagoy, Lagoose, Lagoon, Lagoose. Yay, did you notice? No. <laughs> Most of you, almost <laughs> all of you, know it. I tuned out. Oh, you tuned out, did you? Oh, okay. Anyway, feel triumphant, take a seat. And as I keep reminding you, you can do this as you walk from here to your next appointment to get a cup of coffee, to go and just walk to the car. Uh, you can do many times during the day, and it makes it a natural thing to remember it. Now, uh, the other thing that I suggest you do is when you study your Greek, which I recommend an hour a day, you break those into 10-minute segments. And the first 10-minute segment, you write out the paradigms and declensions that you know. We've just learned the declension of Logos. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? Wow. You too can learn the declension of Logos so easily. Did you stand up and, and march in time? It's so easy to just repeat it as you walk from your home to your car, from your room to lunch. And here is the key to memorizing the language, frequent repetition. The next thing that I'd suggest that will make nominatives and accusatives easier is lots of practice. And here I'd recommend exercise four in chapter four of my book, Beginning New Testament Greek Made Easier. And coming back to the theory that we've learned, if a noun is the subject of a verb, it must be in the nominative case. And if a noun is the direct object of a verb, it must be in the accusative case. Greek indicates grammatical function by the ending placed on the nouns and on the verbs. On the nouns, these endings are called cases. And because their grammatical function is indicated by the case, Greek doesn't pay as much attention to word order as English. In particular, a subject of a verb can often be found quite late in a sentence. So here is our basic strategy for translating. Look for the main verb. Look for the subject. It's going to be in the nominative case. And then look for the direct object of that verb. It's going to be in the accusative case. And then we fit just about everything else in the sentence around that kernel of the sentence. Now, if you follow my tips, I think you'd be surprised how easy you find the nominative and accusative cases in Greek. And if you're interested in the genitive and dative cases, I have other videos on those cases and other topics relating to the Greek New Testament. You can most easily find these videos by subscribing to my YouTube channel, NT Greek Made Easier, or by following me on x.com at Rob McIver 2024. And hey, if you found this video helpful, why not let me know by clicking on the like button below or by clicking on the heart icon. Thank you.